Welcome to my woodshed. First thing I need to acknowledge is my wife's handiwork with making wreaths. She always makes a three foot wreath for the woodshed. So I'm on my fifth year with this wood outdoor wood boiler. It's a Classic Edge 750. And I put that in the same year that I built this woodshed. So the woodshed's going on its fifth year as well. When I built it, I did not want to put any penetrations through the roof. I just didn't want to complicate the build. I didn't think it was necessary. So I put the boiler on one end, sticking out just enough so that the, the stack would go along the edge of it. My woodshed doubles as a garage. It is 40 feet long and 24 feet wide. So the two outside tiers of wood are semi-permanent. We call it our emergency wood. Uh, our intent is not to use it because we'd like to sort of use that as walls. So the inside tiers, which is about a hundred lineal foot of firewood, two feet in length and about five and a half feet tall. So for every linear, uh, for every 11 lineal feet of wood, there's about one cord. So that's how I monitor my usage during the year. I use about 12 cord each year and uh, occasionally we'll have to dip into the emergency wood on the outside walls, but not normally. And it does, even with 12 cords in here, it does leave room for the two tractors, the little one and the bigger guy. So today uh, I was going to clean the boiler and I do that once a week. And it's actually a pretty simple exercise that only takes maybe 15 minutes. So I'll go through that process and give you some thoughts on, on my experience with it over the years. I'm trying to guess where to place the, the barrel, depending on the direction of the wind so that I minimize how much I get in my face. But there's not much to it. I have a, a little scraper here that has uh, rounded edges that sort of fits the die. You can see there's really not much buildup at all. I could probably let this go for a month and really not have any problems. But, but it takes such little time and little effort. I just do it when I do everything else for the week. For the first time when I cleaned this out this year, for the first time, <laughs> for the first time I seen it, there was a dead bird in there. I guess either wanted to make a nest and it didn't work out, or it was just exploring and it didn't work out. That's a little bit of buildup, actually a bit more than I've had most weeks this year. Normally I just take the brush, which is this thing, sort of wearing out. I got this through a, a central boiler supplier, and the central boiler themselves doesn't supply it. I get the name of the place. I will scrape it this time. Uh, I did make this scraper. This is just a paint scraper. I welded it onto um, some flat stock and a piece of, mounted it to a piece of wood just for a handle so that it fits in there. And that's about the depth of the fins, the tube, the exchanger, whatever you want. You can 
see this stuff easily flakes off right down to the down to the original metal and stainless steel. It never builds up, so I don't try to scrape it down to the steel. I just scrape off any loose surface stuff. Now the brush. So you can see the tubes are clean. They still have obviously some surface stuff on them, some creosote buildup, but it's very thin. I don't think it impacts the heat, heat transfer any. Uh, in the bottom, that's really all there is for a week's worth. Uh, the dark stuff on top is what I just flaked off of creosote, and the ash underneath is the white. You can see this is white, burned pretty hot. The newer models, the end in 60, I think 360, 560, 760, and now they make a 960, have tubulators in here. That's it. The rest of it I get from the front. Pretty fine stuff. I do try to minimize these are, are burnable coals. So I will try to separate that out and leave those in because they will burn here in the reaction chamber. I always get some. And that's it. I'll leave some in there, it's a good insulation, and also to, to burn those other pieces of charcoal, essentially. They still have some BTU left in them. So this is a gasifier unit. I think all modern ones uh, to meet EPA standards have to be a gasifier unit, which means the bulk of the burning and the firewood is placed here in the upper chamber. And what that does is that uh, drives off the combustible gases from the wood, but there's not enough oxygen in there for them to completely combust. So there's a secondary air that's fed as the gases exit below and that uh, provides the oxygen for those hot gases to burn and I will show a video here in a bit of it actually operating so it uh, essentially it's a, a gas flame which you uh, similar to what you see uh, burning any gas flame a gas torch <coughs> and this middle here is as the fans it's a single fan that has two dampers one goes to what they call the primary air and that uh, comes in through the sides on each side and there's also some in the back and the secondary damper is what allows air to come into the secondary the reaction chamber and burn those uh, unburnt combustible gases uh, the first several years I had this I used to do pretty meticulous at scraping down 
the build up on the sides the last couple of years i've really not worried about it it doesn't seem to build up excessively i don't think it impacts the operation of it um, they do say in the instructions to clean it out um, you know once a week or whatever to scrape scrape the sides down i'm not sure if that's for corrosion i don't think creosote is all that corrosive particularly against stainless steel but perhaps it is uh, maybe i'm making a mistake but uh, I didn't see a lot of value in it. It was a fair amount of work. It probably doubled or tripled the time it took for me to clean the boiler each each week if I tried to scrape down that, and it was not the funnest job in the world. So you can see the 182. I run it, um, I'll change it a little bit during the year, but when the colder part of the year, I'll put the set point at 190 and either a 10 degree differential meaning it starts at 180 or a 15 degree differential starting at 175 uh, but the way the software is set up whenever you open the door it will go through its cycle if it's below the set point which it is now so you can see here that's um, just the flame from the primary air the secondary air doesn't kick in until the reaction to the reaction chamber temperature which is only 185 now uh, is up to 550 and then it'll start to emit air so we'll wait for that to happen and, and look at the change in the, in the flame so regarding my woodshed this wagon has worked out really well for me it's an old tractor supply dump wagon and i welded some some steel on it to make two tiers. Again, this is 24 inch firewood, so this is four feet total roughly in length. But it's narrow, and as you can see, I can just barely scoot it by my tractor and the side of the tier, which was there on the four by fours. But that works really well just because I can easily load it anywhere along the line here, as long as I have my tractor set over the opposite direction and load it up. So when this is full, this is probably Depends on the temperature, obviously, a day to maybe two and a half days worth of wood. One of the afterthoughts I had in building my woodshed was a spotlight, which points directly into the, uh, the wood section where you load the firewood into the boiler. And that works out well for any maintenance for cleaning, because you don't always have enough flames in there to provide light. So when you're poking around to you know scrape the ashes and stuff and rearrange the coals before you put more wood in it's nice to have a little bit of light they come with this light this actually was a light it still is a light uh but it's useless i guess if you had this out in the open and you didn't have any other source of light it would be useful but i don't think it really does much the other thing which i did not realize with these outdoor boilers and i'm thinking it's the same with all of them <coughs> is that when you load them, uh, even if you have the, the bypass door open, there's not enough draft, not enough volume to go up the chimney. So you have a lot of smoke that comes out this door. As you can see, a lot of the smoke and even some of the wood is starting to turn dark. So I'm glad I didn't completely enclose this or enclose it any more than I did because there's oftentimes a lot of smoke that comes out when I load it and the smoke will just dissipate out the sides of the woodshed. Uh, if I did have the woodshed to build over again, I don't think I would have firewood as the outside walls. I would probably actually have outside walls. The thought was I could put wood in here that may not be completely dry and it would finish seasoning in here if I had it all open. But I did that one year, put some relatively green wood in here and it did not dry well at all. It's uh, either lack of sunlight, obviously there's a roof here, or just the lack of um, <clears throat> wind that went between the tiers. I'm not sure, but it did not dry well in here. So I've learned that lesson to fully season it outside and only bring it inside here when it's fully seasoned. Don't expect it to dry out much uh, more in addition to that. So I would still have some provision for the smoke that comes out when I load the boiler. But I think I would have conventional sides 
and not worry so much about uh, using the woods as the walls. It is nice out here not to have the wind blowing when I'm <laughs> loading wood or, uh, or cleaning the boiler. I have a little rack here for some of the, the basic tools that I use. So we can see uh, we've up to almost a thousand degrees here in the reaction temperature, right there, 920. So we should have a different looking flame under here now. You can see with some of the smoky stuff that I uh, just shut in here, it'll go start to burn. The nature of that flame will be different if it's like 12 to 1300 degrees, it'll be almost transparent. A much hotter flame. This obviously is not super hot, about a thousand degrees. You can see just to the right of that uh, is the temperature probe, so that's where it's measuring the, the temperature right there near the flame. And the hot gases go back and up through that heat exchanger. With the new ones in this reaction chamber, you can't do this. I think there's a limit switch on the door. I suppose you could bypass it. But they have refractory that forces that flame out this way um, and circulates it. Uh, probably to try to mix all the hot gases to make sure there's a complete combustion but it comes out this way and then the flame reverses and goes back i think it hits against the door there's some additional refractory on the door compared to this one but it would not be advisable to open this up with the new ones <laughs> you'd have a flame pointing right at you so i haven't filled this yet for the day so you can see there's just a small pile of wood uh, I will put some more wood in there and uh, normally uh, when I put fresh wood in and it just starts to burn that fresh pile, the temperature will go up much more in the reaction chamber. So let's put some wood in it for the day. It's a warm day, really warm. I'll only load it to about the bottom of the door and see what the reaction chamber flame looks like. There it is, filled for the day. So it's nearly at the set point 188, 190 is the set point, so it's above a thousand degrees. Flame looks quite a bit different. Obviously, uh, a lot more gas is being burned, more flame. But at 189, it's going to start to to reduce the air that is submitting to the chamber you can see up there there is no smoke i'll have a little bit of smoke when it first starts up normally for the cycle so the other issue i had initially with with this woodshed was drainage you i'm sure you cannot see on camera but uh from here to the left it, it goes goes down a little bit uh, and until I fixed my drainage on the opposite side, uh, I had a lot of water sheeting across this gravel area and into my woodshed. So I think it was probably year one or year two I put this great drain in. And this, is, this has done a great job. This great drain has done a great job. And that drains, it catches a perimeter drain under the, under the P-stone there and then off daylight onto the onto the field there as it uh, goes downhill. So I still get a little bit of runoff as you can see, not nearly as much as you can see that sheet of ice. That's where most of the water now is run off. These racks here I made this summer. This is my latest attempt at trying to make wood processing, firewood processing a bit more efficient. Each of these racks holds exactly a half a cord. If it's leveled to the top, they are eight feet wide, four feet high, and with a two foot long firewood, then that makes for exactly a half a cord. So I have 30 of them. That'll allow me a 15 cord. So that 12 cord that I normally burn, plus a little bit extra. So this boiler was set for three circuits to be connected to it. I've used two of them, these two, and then this one 
has the connections, but um, I just spray foamed, over, spray foamed over them. This lug here is an inch and a quarter line. It has a larger circulator. Uh, goes to the house continuously. Basically, I plug it in in October, and I don't unplug it until April or May. This smaller one, the, the 007 Taiko, uh, is what goes to the garage circuit, and I'll show that in a bit. This one I just plug in as I need to. Uh, generally, I'll plug it in if the temperature is going to drop below zero to make sure the garage doesn't go below freezing, or if I want to work out there and I actually want to heat it up to do some work in the garage. In the house loop, you can see the two inch and a quarter lines coming uh, from the boiler, hence the little arrow, isn't that cute? Going into the plate heat exchanger, I'll get to that in a second. And then from the heat exchanger, after it's given up the heat uh, to the house, goes back to the boiler through the other inch and a quarter line. So running these lines was a bit awkward just because of where I wanted or needed to come in through the basement and where the heat exchanger and the other components sat. So I had this weird 90 degree corner, but it works fine, but I'm sure it does provide a bit more flow restriction than is ideal. To explain the components, I just have a drain and fill, uh, which I don't think I've used, but it's there if I need it. I have an aquastat or a, uh, a switch, a temperature switch, which is just superficially there on the pipe. What that does is it um, basically interrupts the signal to my oil boiler as long as the temperature of this water is above, I think, 145. So if I'm not home and the fire goes out for some reason and the temperature of the water from the boiler goes below 145, it'll allow the oil boiler to kick on and provide heat to the house. There's a strainer here which I think I've only purged once. I probably should do it again. So the plate heat exchanger is the biggest one I could find, at least on the website, that provides uh, common components for, for boilers, wood, wood boilers. I think it's either 300 or 350,000 BTU per hour. They're plate heat exchangers. They have small clearances. Over time, I figured there's going to be some passages that are blocked. I just didn't want to have to replace that because the heat transfer capacity uh, was diminished over time, so I got a big one. So now I'll go over on the other side and show you how it hitches into my house system. So the water from the wood boiler is deep unpressurized atmospheric pressure. These braided hoses, uh, braided pipes, which are also inch and a quarter, are the pressurized system, which is a conventional uh, hot water baseboard system comes out of the heat exchanger and ties into the return line. So the return line is uh, all the the zones come in through this um, through this leg goes either into the boiler in the case of the winter time I have this shut off and it is forced to go through the heat exchanger so the water on its way back from the zones goes through the heat exchanger gets heated up and then into the boiler so that the boiler is um, the temperature satisfied. I do have a strainer here on the pressurized boiler side that again I need to purge because I haven't done it for a while. In the summertime if I think of it then I will shut one, really just need to shut one of these legs either to or from the heat exchanger and then open up this so uh, the water would go straight into the boiler rather than be diverted into the heat exchanger. I forgot to do that last year. There's really not any significant implications other than you're needlessly running water through extra pipe in the heat exchanger. In the garage loop, the one inch lines come through the frost wall up through the floor. And you can see up in that corner, I do have two valves, ball valves that are shut, thankfully. Uh, provision for um, a Modine type heater, which I do not have there obviously, but then I uh, branch off into two lines. One goes to the Modine heater in that corner, and the other one goes to a Modine heater in that corner, 
and the white hex line goes to the Modine heater in this corner. Uh, these these two these two were Modine heaters on the front of the garage near the garage doors. That one and the one over there are I think the smallest ones you can get. Maybe the next size up. The Modine heater in this corner is a couple sizes bigger. Normally, if I do have heat going to the garage, and I will only plug in the circulator as I need it, just having the radiant heat from the hot water going through the PEX lines running along the corner of the ceiling is enough to keep the garage warm. Maybe not quite warm enough to comfortably work in here if it's, say, 10 degrees or less outside, but it'll always keep the, the garage, say, 40 to 50 degrees, regardless of what the temperature is outside. So I only use the Modine heaters uh, if I'm doing work in here and want a bit warmer than that. I do have them hooked to a thermostat, a Honeywell type thermostat, just plugged into the wall. There's one other thing I wanted to review before I close this video out that I sort of forgot about, which is an issue I had with the primary air tubes or ducts uh, one on this side and the other on that side. And they plugged up with creosote. I didn't realize that until I'd run it for two full years. And then I noticed there was diminished uh, air coming out and it wasn't burning as well. So I took these off. Uh, these are just sheet metal that, um, that covers a channel which is in the water box or in the water leg. Uh, and it makes a square square air channel for the primary air to run on the left side and the right side. So I took that off as just uh, two bolts. It comes off pretty easily. Two nuts actually. Acorn nuts. And I cleaned out the, the creosote. So I do that annually now during the summer before I start up for the fall. The newer ones, the 60 series, 760s in this case, I believe they still have the same channel uh, in the water jacket but uh, instead of having the sheet metal, they actually have a, uh, a round uh, metal duct with the holes in it. So I'm, I'm assuming that probably is better because uh, this is not a very tight seal. So smoke, which contains the creosote, is allowed to condense in there if you get smoke inside there. So I'm guessing uh, a change in that design was to address the issue with creosote building up. So that is it for this video. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it.